Good morning. I'm Jill Fryer. Hey, everybody. I'm Savannah Sellers. Thanks for being here right now on Morning News Now. A grieving community. This morning, we're learning more about the victims in the mass shooting at a mall in Texas. Among them, a couple and their young child, two young sisters, and a security guard. More on what we're learning about those victims and the disturbing new information investigators have discovered about the gunman's background. Debt debate. The clock is ticking down to when the government will run out of money. And today, a key meeting between President Biden and congressional leaders. Democrats and Republicans are still far apart on a deal, though. We'll have more on the likelihood they'll reach an agreement in time and what it could mean for you if they don't. Also this morning, prepping for Paris. We are almost a year out from the Summer Olympic and Paralympic Games. And some of the world's best athletes are already gearing up for competition. Two decorated Paralympians join us in studio this hour with how they're getting ready for Paris, plus their message to Americans on why the Paralympics are a must-watch event. Plus, pack your bags. Summer travel season is approaching. You've got your list of the top places for your vacation. Whether you want to stay in the U.S. or put your passport to use, we've got the must-visit cities this summer and how to make sure you get the best deal and make sure that passport is up to date because that's a tough thing to do these days. Exactly. <laughs> and, and we're going to need the deals because tickets are expensive. So expensive. <laughs> that's right. But we'll tell you where you should go <laughs> as long as we can afford it. All right. We'll begin with disturbing new information this morning about the man who shot and killed eight people at a Dallas area mall over the weekend. A social media page appearing to belong to Mauricio Garcia shared extremist beliefs with rants against Jews, women and racial minorities. He also shared pictures on a Russian social networking site of the outlet mall where the attack took place, as well as this photo appearing to show the 33-year-old shirtless with multiple Nazi tattoos. A senior law enforcement source said that Garcia's social media activity is part of their investigation. Witnesses described the chaos and the confusion the moment the shooting began. There's this guy dressed in all black, wearing a vest, has an assault rifle, and he's just shooting at people. There was dead people on the floor. A lot of people, they were, like, you know, hiding. And as I was going around, they told me to get away, you know, to move out. And I kept on telling them, I'm looking for my daughter. This morning, we are also learning more about the victims, three of them children. They include a young boy and his parents, two elementary school age sisters, a security guard, and an engineer. NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa is in Allen, Texas, with the latest on the investigation. Hey, good morning from, as you can see, this growing memorial here in Allen, Texas. The outpouring of grief and support in this community just insurmountable. This days after Saturday's mass shooting, America's latest mass shooting here at this outlet mall. And also, this comes as senior law enforcement officials tell NBC News a series of posts from the alleged shooter, 33-year-old Mauricio Garcia, are a key part of their investigation into what led up to and what fueled this shooting. It, largely, those posts coming from a Russian social media platform on which Garcia alluded to white power beliefs. He posted photos of his torso that appear to show white ta power tattoos, including a swastika tattoo. They say he ranted online about multiple minorities, about women, about Jews. And he also, they say, in the days leading up to this shooting, posted dozens of photos of this outlet mall. And they say he may have been monitoring it during its busiest times. Of course, as we tend to see in, wake, in the wake of these shootings nationwide, statewide, a lot of conversations about gun control. Texas Republicans, including Governor Greg Abbott, Senator Ted Cruz, among those saying this is not about guns. This is about mental health. Of course, their Democrat colleagues arguing that it is indeed about guns and everybody kind of focusing in on that debate as we tend to see again in the wake of these horrific events. And at the same time, of course, most importantly, we are learning far more about the eight innocent lives lost, including three young children from two separate North Texas families. The youngest three-year-old James Cho killed along with his parents, Cindy and Q, and law enforcement officials tell us his six-year-old brother, William, is the only member of the family to survive. He just turned six. The Mendoza family losing 11-year-old Daniela, 8-year-old Sofia, their mother in critical condition. Also among the victims, 32-year-old Elio Cumana Rivas, 26-year-old Ashwaria Tata Condia, and 23-year-old security guard Christian LaCour. And then finally, the last person that we want to highlight here is authorities say the police officer, who is the one who killed the shooter in the wake or in the midst of all of this gunfire, all of this panic. That officer was wounded, an attorney overnight speaking out about that officer, saying he is doing well, adding he's a brave servant with a gentle heart. Guys, I'll send it back to you. 
All right, Maggie, thank you so much. In Washington today, top congressional leaders will meet with President Biden at the White House. They are hoping to reach an agreement to avoid a financial catastrophe. Yeah, but this morning, Democrats and Republicans are far apart on a deal to raise the debt ceiling. And the clock is ticking down to a critical deadline. Well, last week, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen warned the U.S. could hit that ceiling and face potential severe economic consequences as soon as June 1st. Let's bring in NBC News White House correspondent Mike Memoli. Hey, Mike. So tell us, what can we expect from today's meeting? and also remind us here of the stakes if they don't reach a deal. The White House recently laid out really a grim scenario if the debt ceiling isn't raised and the U.S. defaults on its debts. Walk us through that. Yeah, Savannah, I mean, we've had these kinds of crisis moments in Washington before where both sides go to the brink but ultimately get a deal. I've never seen one quite like this where no one quite sees the path to a deal. And frankly, they head into this meeting disagreeing on even what the meeting is about. President Biden, the White House, saying that he still says Congress has to pass a clean debt limit increase. In other words, just pass it without any spending conditions attached. And there's just over three weeks for them to reach a deal. Now, the White House raising the stakes by laying out what would happen under a range of scenarios. The worst case scenario, a protracted debt default would lead to more than 8 million jobs lost. The stock market could lose uh, potentially half of its value. A shorter term crisis would lead to the loss of about half a million jobs. But consider this, even if they reach a deal, but only at the last minute, you're still talking about the loss of 200,000 jobs. Just to put that into context, last month, we just got last week the, the jobs report from last month, and we gained 250,000 jobs in the last month. So you're talking about a month's worth of job gains wiped out, even if they get a deal on time. And so that's mm -hmm. why the tone that the leaders express coming out of this meeting will be so important. Do they indicate that there might be a path to deal, or are they still far apart on what they're even talking about? Mm -hmm. So, Mike, this is going to be House Speaker Kevin McCarthy's first face-to-face -face meeting with the president since February. Two weeks ago, House Republicans did pass their debt ceiling plan, but it's tied to deep spending cuts. That's a non-starter for the president and congressional Democrats. I, I know you cover the White House, but you keep close tabs on Congress as well. I mean, does McCarthy have room to maneuver in these negotiations at all? You look at what the House Republicans passed just a few weeks ago, their answer to the debt ceiling deal, it, re it would have lead to about $4.5 trillion in spending cuts over the next 10 years. It would also lift that debt ceiling for a short-term basis. The Speaker was only able to pass that by one single vote. And we remember it took him 15 votes to secure the Speakership. And interestingly, the Republicans who voted against that deal uh, just a few weeks ago, they weren't the moderate members who were worried about those spending cuts being too high. They were the you know, right wing base who said it mm. said it didn't go far enough. So when you have the president talking about three trillion trillion dollars in spending reductions over the next 10 years, Republicans talking about more than four and a half trillion, you might say, let's just split the difference. But McCarthy is under enormous pressure from that uh, right wing base in his caucus to not budge an inch. And that's why it's a really dicey moment for him as well. And Mike, I know the president's expected to be here in New York on Wednesday. He's going to take his message on the debt ceiling to a region represented by GOP House members. What's that strategy? Yeah, I'll be coming up there for that. You know that. And <laughs> it's interesting because there are 18 congressional districts that elected a Republican last November in the midterms. But these districts also voted for President Biden in 2020. So that's your definition of a swing district, and the president's going to one mm -hmm. of them. It's represented by Mike Lawler. He voted for that GOP spending bill uh, just in the last couple of weeks. And Republicans like him have been targeted by the White House and by Democratic allies for what those cuts would mean to their constituents. So the president's going to go to his district to make that case himself, talking about what it would mean for especially veterans care. There's a VA hospital near his district. This is about really two different things. The president, one, wants to see if he can put pressure on McCarthy by putting pressure on him not from the right wing end of his base, uh, but from the moderates in his caucus, but also to really lay down a marker that when the elections come in 2024, these are the really target districts Democrats will go after first and foremost. And so they want to lay the groundwork for potentially unseating them so Democrats have a shot at winning back the House. And Mike, we are preparing for your visit. We have the green M&Ms ready, the perfectly chilled water, all as requested. So the you know what that I picks request. You up. You're going to be good. It. You know, let's, perfect. 68 what? degrees. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> a last thing we'll ask you here. I mean, for Speaker McCarthy, if he can't reach a deal with the White House, then what? Are there any other options here? Well, we're really in this moment talking about sort of hail mary scenarios. One is a so-called discharge petition. What that really looks like is Democrats would be able to force a vote on the House floor on a 
so-called clean increase, if they can get maybe five, six, seven Republicans to support this. Uh, Congressman from North Carolina, Democrat Jeff Jackson, yesterday, he said, this is actually McCarthy's dream scenario. If this happened, he would complain like heck publicly, say this was a terrible thing, but privately he would be saying, thank goodness, because this would get him out of an impossible situation with his base. On the White House end of things, there's this talk of the 14th Amendment option. This would really let the president say, I can raise the debt limit on my own without Congress. Even his own administration, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, saying this weekend she doesn't want to entertain those kinds of emergency options. There's a lot of legal uncertainty that would be raised if mm. he took that path. All right, Mike, we will certainly be talking to you about this throughout the week. Thank you so much. We have new developments this morning in that deadly crash along the Texas border that killed eight people. The driver of that vehicle, George Alvarez, is now facing manslaughter charges, but police are still looking into a possible motive. Now, cities along the border are bracing for a new wave of migrants when a COVID-era immigration policy expires later this week. NBC News Homeland Security correspondent Julia Ainsley joins us with the latest. Good morning, Julia. So first of all, where do things stand in the investigation into the driver and a possible motive? Well, Joe, it's really complicated. We actually don't have as many answers at this point as we thought we might. But yes, they know that they've identified the driver as George Alvarez. But investigators told us yesterday that he's not cooperating. They actually haven't been able to talk to him as much as they would like to. He has a very long history, a very long criminal history, including assault with a deadly weapon, threatening elders, people in his family. Uh, this is someone who definitely has a track record here, but so far not cooperating. Also, so far, the charges manslaughter but they haven't ruled out other charges that could come when they find out the motive. Because of that context here, Title 42 lifting, a surge of migrants down in Brownsville. I was just there on Friday when 2,300 migrants crossed just that morning. Because of that surge, a lot of people thought maybe this might be anti-immigrant motivated. But right now, we just don't have those answers. They're charging him with manslaughter after he ran a large SUV into that group of migrants standing at a bus stop. Joe. You know, one of the reasons this investigation is complicated, authorities say is because some of the victims were migrants. What more can you tell us about that aspect of the investigation? Yeah, beyond just the fact that George Alvarez isn't cooperating, a lot of the witnesses may have, uh, some of them have had some anecdotes, some things that they've said about the scene that haven't been corroborated by police. That's also been confusing just from a reporting perspective. And they also say that sometimes it's hard to talk to these victims because you ha and the people who were there and witnesses because you also have to work with their government, many of them Venezuelan. That's a tough task. Here's what they had to say about that yesterday. It, it has been a, a very tiresome process, but one that we are deeply committed to doing and accomplishing. We are working with the Venezuelan government right now, and we have also reached out to other embassies. And of course, it's very difficult for the U.S. government often, or people in the United States to work with the Venezuelan government. They're not notoriously cooperative with Americans, um, but they are going to continue this process as they try to piece together what exactly happened and especially what George Alvarez may have said at the time of the scene and what his demeanor may have been like if he had any anti-immigrant rhetoric as he approached this bus stop or after, they would want to know that. And of course, Julia, this all comes with Title 42 set to expire in two days on Thursday. Remind us again what that policy is and the strain that all this is really putting on border communities like Brownsville. That's right. So Title 42 is a COVID-19 restrictions that have turned migrants away more than 2.5 million times before they could claim asylum when they cross the southern border. Because that national COVID emergency is lifting, that means at 11.59 p.m. on May 11th, so really looking at May 12th, more migrants will be able to cross and be able to claim asylum. However, some policies have changed. The Biden administration has put new restrictions in place to raise the bar on what exactly migrants will need to prove in order to come into the United States. But but what I've learned from a lot of border agents when I was down there last week is that really what they're expecting is an increase in processing times as they determine who can stay and who can't. That could lead to backlogs at the border already in cities like El Paso, where I'm going just about to head down there later today. I'm told as many as 2,000 are sleeping on the street, many of those unprocessed because they're able to cross before Border Patrol even interacts with them because Border Patrol is already stretched so thin. They're $3 billion in the hole. They need more funding from Congress for this. And right now, it looks like those border communities are going to be the ones bearing the brunt of this surge. All right. Safe travels today, Julia. Thank you, as always, for your reporting.
And what's happening at the border is being felt across the country. For several months, southern states have been sending busloads of migrants north to places like New York City. Now Mayor Eric Adams is trying to relocate some of those migrants to surrounding suburbs. But those towns are pushing back. NBC News Now correspondent Valerie Castro has the latest. The migrant crisis spilling over from the border, now pitting some of the suburbs of New York against the city. It's a farce, and it will not happen on our watch. Local leaders declaring a state of emergency and criticizing Mayor Eric Adams for announcing a program to send several hundred migrants to two counties outside of New York City. Rockland is not going to stand idly by while your administration, which boasts itself as a sanctuary city, diverts busloads of undocumented individuals to our county. The city's plan, which it says could be expanded, is for single men to be housed at local hotels for up to four months. The county social services director says Mayor Adams didn't give them a choice. And it was not a question, could we? It was, you will. Uh, these people are coming. And again, not a lot of information. Uh, not time frames other than it's imminent. This hotel in Orangetown, one of the planned sites where the town's Republican supervisor says they were given little notice. Absolutely blindsided. Teresa Kenny sharing this photo of mattresses outside the hotel as it prepared for the buses, describing an interaction with a hotel employee who said he was instructed to take queen beds out of rooms and put two twin beds in 60 to 70 rooms. The town saying such boarding is not the intended use of the hotel, issuing a formal notice to the business, citing a change of occupancy violation. WNBC was on site but unable to get a comment from the hotel and Rockland County declaring a state of emergency for the next 30 days that state of emergency will prohibit other municipalities from bringing and housing people in the county and prohibit hotels and motels from housing immigrants without a license eric adams calling the move a forced undertaking saying the program is part of the city's compassionate response and adding it will provide migrants with temporary housing access to services and connections to local communities as they build a stable life He's trying to balance the logistical and humanitarian challenges with the national political debate and has even been critical of President Biden. Why are you doing this to New York? The national government has turned its back on New York City. And New York isn't the only city dealing with the issue. The suburban send-off also played out in Chicago last year, the village of Burr Ridge receiving dozens of migrants in September to the surprise of the mayor. I still have not gotten an official word from the city. Grasso telling us Mayor Lightfoot is doing to him what Greg Abbott did to her. She never said she'd be sending them out to the suburbs. Back in New York. They're, they're trying to destroy uh, the suburbs. And at least this county executive thinks it's just the beginning. The city of New York right now is on the edge of making things much, much worse. Our thanks to Valerie for that report. Well, the program is starting with several hundred people. The government expects that number to grow when Title 42 expires later this week. As far as who pays for it, New York City says it will foot the bill for shelter, plus three meals a day, along with health care, laundry and more. Well, this morning, the New York City jury is scheduled to begin deliberations in the civil rape case against former President Donald Trump. Writer E. Jean Carroll is accusing Trump of battery and defamation, stemming from an allegation that he raped her in a department store back in the mid-90s. Carroll came forward with the allegation, which the former president has continued to deny, in 2019. Kristen gibbons Fedden joins us now. She's an NBC News legal analyst as well as a civil rights attorney and former prosecutor. Kristen, good morning. Thanks for being here. So let's start with close arguments that we heard from Donald Trump's lawyer, Joe Tacopina. What were the main points he made? The main points he made is that he argued that Carol's claim was an affront to justice, and those are the exact words that he used. And he basically highlighted that there was no objective evidence to really corroborate her allegations. He also pointed out that Carol was not able to recall the exact date of the alleged rape, and he questioned how Trump could even bring up a defense or an alibi if he couldn't even combat the fact that there was no date. He also argued the, uh, the significance of no police report and really questioned Carol's credibility. And I think one of the most effective things that he did was that he gave the jury or illustrated in his closing that the jury could both think that Trump was crude based on those Hollywood access tapes as well as his combative demeanor within the deposition excerpts that were played and still find Carol not credible. 
And Carol's lawyers, I, I want to play something that they had played, a specific part of Trump's deposition for the jury to hear referencing that infamous Access Hollywood tape. Let's watch that quickly. And you say, and again, this has become very famous in this video, I just start kissing them. It's like a magnet. Just kiss. I don't even wait. And when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. Grab them by the You can do anything. That's what you said, correct? Well, historically, that's true with stars. It's true with stars that, that they can grab women by the Well, that's what... It's, if you look over the last million years, I guess that's been largely true. Not always, but largely true. Unfortunately or fortunately. So, Kristen, again, just to be clear for our audience, that was part of a taped deposition that was then played. We did not see the former president actually on the stand or anything like that. Do we know, though, how playing that specific part of the deposition could play into the plaintiff's strategy here? Yeah, I think it actually plays in two crucial ways. Because keep in mind that Carol is suing both for defamation as well as for um, assault and battery, so the rape. So with regard to um, the defamation claim, she was able, uh, Carol's attorney was able to argue that Trump is, um, this was part of his M.O. He was assaulting her in the same manner that he assaulted other women. And it worked beautifully with regard to the other act um, evidence, those other two women who said that he assaulted her in the same way. But then when she showed that Access Hollywood, as well as with the other um, aspect of the deposition where he mistakenly identified uh, Carol as his former wife, she was able to then show putting those together, that Carol was exactly Trump's type and that he was going to take her and rape her in exactly the way that he identified in that Access Hollywood tape. So you mentioned the fact that defamation is part of this. So there is, there's defamation as well as battery. Those are these two things here. It's not just this alleged rape. How difficult historically are either of those two things to prove here? What's it going to take? It is very difficult. Defamation is really difficult um, for many reasons, but essentially you have to prove uh, the falsity of statements. So it's kind mm -hmm. of like counterintuitive. Similarly, um, sexual assault crimes and uh, liability are also very difficult to prove just because it's he said, she said. But I think in this case, and I have tried these cases over and over throughout the entirety of my career, it's the mountain of evidence that really helps to bolster the credibility of the survivor. And in this case, I think the plaintiff did a great job doing so. Mm. Kristen Gibbons fed and thank you so much. It's looking like a rainy Tuesday for parts of the country. Let's get a check on your morning news now forecast. Andrew Lassman joins us now and is tracking those storms this morning. Hey, Angie. Hey, guys. We've got a couple of showers working through parts of the mid-Atlantic and along the East Coast. We've even got some shower activity through parts of the Plains. But it's down through Texas that we're really going to keep a close eye on over the next couple of days for heavy rounds of rain, multiple rounds of rain that lead to the potential for some flooding. Here's the, the rainfall amounts that we'll expect. You can see this goes up into parts of the Plains. We'll get a couple of inches into places like Bismarck, Denver, but near the Houston area, specifically the Houston metro, we could see upwards of five inches of rain through at least the next couple of days. This is the area that we're looking at for the flooding concern. It does go into parts of Little Rock, Shreveport, into Mississippi and extending out east. We'll see uh, maybe a quarter of an inch or a half an inch of rain over the next few days. But specifically, the Houston metro area is where we'll watch for that moderate risk for flash flooding at least through the day today. The saturated soils, they've already had recent rainfall, and we could see rainfall rates pretty impressive, two and a half inches per hour. So that's the reason that we're looking at uh, some concern for flooding in that area. But that's not the only thing we have to watch for today. We also have five million people at risk for some severe weather. It's in two locations. The first is out towards the Carolinas. We have North Carolina, Virginia, South Carolina, all included in this. We'll look for the better potential for some of those stronger storms, though, to be centered into parts of the plains. There will, that will include Wichita, Oklahoma City. And we're mainly looking at the risk for some large hail. We're talking baseball size that does include Salina, Dodge City, but also Wichita, Black Belt, Tulsa included in uh, one inch hail as well. And if you're paying attention tomorrow too, we'll have that severe risk centered mainly close to the Rockies. Denver included in that, Cheyenne, Casper, as we look for once again a day of afternoon, uh, strong wind gusts, maybe some damaging hail, and even a couple of tornadoes here uh, as we get into the afternoon and evening hours tomorrow. But how about those temperatures across the southeast? Boy, it's way warmer than normal. Little Rock is headed to the 
90s today. Kansas City is headed to the low 80s. Amarillo will hit 94 degrees this afternoon. And it's tomorrow, too, for parts of the Midwest, ending up into the upper 70s in Chicago, upper 70s for Minneapolis. And these numbers are, are above normal for this time of year, and it goes through the weekend for parts of New York, guys. We are headed to the low 80s. It'll be a, a quite a nice weekend ahead. Another outdoor brunch weekend. There you go. Right, here we go. Know, it's great. Yeah, very exciting. Thanks, All right, Angie. Angie. Thank you. Well, coming up, Russia is celebrating Victory Day, marking the defeat of Nazi Germany in World War II. But as celebrations and commemorations there get underway, the war in Ukraine is casting a shadow over the event. What Russian President Vladimir Putin told crowds this morning and what it could mean for the situation in Ukraine. Next. Russia is celebrating what's known as Victory Day today. The event marks the defeat of Nazi Germany in World War II and commemorates the tens of millions of Russians who died during that conflict. Earlier this morning, Russian President Vladimir Putin delivered a speech in Moscow during the military parade with the war in Ukraine, though, of course, casting a shadow over the occasion. NBC News reporter Matt Bodner joins us now for more on this. Hi, Matt. Good morning. So walk us through some of the main things that we heard from Putin in this speech. What did he say? Savannah, good morning. Well, we actually we heard a lot from Vladimir Putin this morning. Uh, this is kind of his day to, to appear to be a very tough leader, and he always relishes in that opportunity. So uh, today we heard things like uh, civilization is at a turning point, on the brink, if you will, and a real war has been unleashed on Russia. So we saw a lot of that kind of rhetoric uh, painting Russia as on the defensive. Now, this has really been uh, a cornerstone of Vladimir Putin's talking points for years. Uh, of course, these kinds of messages are kind of heightened uh, amid the war in Ukraine. Some of the other highlights I want to share with you guys being uh, comments such as uh, uh, saying the catastrophe that Ukraine is experiencing right now is the product of the West's greedy, corrupt plans to sort of suffocate anything it perceives as the other. So it's just a lot of very incendiary rhetoric. I do think it's important to note while looking at these kinds of comments that they are, I would say, rather similar to things we've heard from Vladimir Putin over the past 18 months, but uh, also noteworthy what we didn't hear. And I think coming less than a week after, after drones were exploding over the Kremlin, uh, uh, claims of an assassination attempt, possibly Western involvement, we didn't hear very much of that from President Putin today. So I think uh, you could, if you wanted to, make the argument that we got restrained Vladimir Putin today. So, Matt, we understand, you know, some parades were called off in some cities. Other events, including the main one in Moscow, were scaled down. Why was that? Well, I think there's a few reasons for it. The one that, that we keep seeing from the Russians, or, or at least hints of it, is, is that there were security concerns. Obviously, I mentioned uh, that there was, there was a drone strike on the Kremlin last week. There was a lot, a lot, of, a lot of fuss around that. But there have been drone strikes and in, in other incidents happening across Russia. So we actually saw in dozens of Russian cities this parade was, was effectively canceled. They did not happen in many places. And that's a really big deal. This parade is kind of the cornerstone of the Kremlin's domestic narrative, its domestic uh, propaganda machine. And it's a little bit like, I mean, what kind of conversations would we be having if, the, if, if suddenly July 4th was canceled across half of the United States? So there's mm. definitely a, an apparent security concern going on. But when you look at the Moscow Victory Day Parade, now, uh, for years now, especially the Moscow Victory Day Parade has been kind of the annual showpiece for the entire Russian military, where, uh, especially where I think President Putin would like to show off the very latest and greatest, but also some of the old, some of the old weapons. Uh, the Russian Air Force was not present at the Victory Day Parade in Moscow today. And we only saw one tank, and that was a tank from the Second World War. So there's definitely, clearly, some kind of equipment issue going on for oh. the parade, and it doesn't really... It doesn't portray the same kind of confidence that we've seen in, in years past. Mm. Matt, this is playing out amid another wave of missile strikes aimed at Kyiv overnight. Uh, tell us what's happening in Ukraine and how they are marking the day there again, Victory Day. Sure. Well, so obviously um, there was yet another missile strike, drone strike from Russia, uh, as we've seen in recent days. Uh, it appears to have been smaller than some of the, the ones we've seen in recent days. But uh, I'd say, how is Ukraine celebrating today? They're not. One of the most interesting things they've done is actually in the past few days, President Zelensky uh, uh, called to move Ukraine's holiday. Typically, um, I guess I should say, in the, in, the, in the Soviet Union, Victory Day was celebrated on May 9th. But in the West, we celebrate Victory in Europe Day on May 8th. And this has kind of been a bit of contention between the two sides, the former allies, uh, the entire time. Ukraine actually moved their celebration from May 9th to May 8th this year. And I think uh, if you're familiar with kind of the historiography of the region, it's a very, it's a very symbolic move. Mm -hmm. Matt Bodner, thank you very much.
More international news now. More violence in Israel with deadly airstrikes in Gaza overnight. That's right. NBC News foreign correspondent Claudio Labanga is following the latest on that, as well as other international headlines for us. Hi, Claudio. Good morning. Good morning, Savannah and Joe. Well, yes, in the early hours of this morning, Israel carried out a series of airstrikes all across Gaza, killing at least 12 Palestinians and injuring 20 more. Now, the Israeli military said it was targeting militants who pose an immediate threat to its citizens, as well as sites used to manufacture weapons. The Al-Quds Brigades, the military wing of the Palestinian Islamist organization Islamic Jihad, confirmed that the three commanders were among those killed. But Palestinian health officials say that three women and three children were also among the dead. Now let's go to China, where a Canadian diplomat was expelled on Tuesday. China's foreign ministry said it was deploying a reciprocal countermeasure to Canada's unscrupulous move, referring to the, to can, the Canadian expulsion of a Chinese official allegedly involved in a plot to intimidate an opposition lawmaker and his relatives. Now China said it reserves the right to take further actions in response. And finally, he stole the limelight during the coronation of King Charles III over the weekend with his hilarious expressions and yawns. Now at age five, Prince Louis has undertaken his first royal engagement. The youngest child of the Prince and Princess of Wales joined his parents and siblings on the so-called Big Help Out, a nationwide volunteering initiative. Now Louis joined his father on a digger and helped fill a wheelbarrow with sand as his family joined the scouts to renovate their scout hut. Well, by his expression, he seems to enjoy a lot more uh, this than watching <laughs> his grandfather being crowned king, guys. I think there just needs to be a, five. a Louis reality show. No, I am really into his vibe. I just, yeah, yeah. It's so funny. Just, Thanks, just Claudia. Appreciate more. it. Thank you. Well, coming up, new research shows Asian Americans are among the groups least likely to seek mental health treatment. Well, now the White House is looking to change that. We have an exclusive look at the resources coming available to them. Plus, smartwatches can give a better idea of our physical health, but it turns out they can also give you insight into your mental health. We've got that next. Welcome back. The White House is taking steps to address mental health problems in the Asian American, Pacific Islander, and Native Hawaiian communities. Health and Human Services Secretary Javier Becerra sat down for an exclusive interview with NBC News correspondent Richard Louie to explain why these resources are needed and how the Biden administration plans to provide them. For the first time at this scale in eight years, HHS Secretary Javier Becerra kicked off an in-person White House summit for Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And the subject is personal to him. I went to school with uh, a very diverse community, very heavily Asian, many similar traits to the Latino community, many immigrant families, uh, many who come hoping to do more, never having had a chance to go to college. and. I relate to so many of the, the fights and struggles that folks in the AA and NHPI community have. What have you seen in the last year that actually works to combat the misperceptions and the violence in the community? We've heard about some of these hate crimes that have been out there uh, targeting AA and NHPI. It's a fight, but it's a fight that we do together. And it's not just a, one particular community. The Biden administration released its first ever strategy for the AANHPI community. It includes plans prepared by 32 federal agencies, including addressing anti-Asian hate, expanding language access, and cultivating community partnerships, among others. The secretary also took note of how business can help, mentioning the new Barbie doll out this month of the first Asian American Hollywood star, actress Anna Mae Wong. It is nice when you have that toy have that mentor, and you see yourself in that. Because for too many years, for too many generations, we couldn't see ourselves. Let's shift over to Mental Health Awareness Month. How are we doing? How many people are going through this every year? When 90% of the American public says that America is experiencing a mental health crisis, that bar is really high. We have established 988, which is working fabulously well in letting those who are on the edge, who are about to take the wrong fork in the road and maybe commit suicide, they now can call or text or chat 
988. To help reduce stigma, a new tool just released by his department. You now can go on this website, findsupport.gov, and get a sense, I, I'm starting to feel pretty bad or I have a friend who's really having issues. So it's like 988, except it's a search engine. Yeah, one of the reasons we still have such a crisis in the mental health system is because people don't want to admit it. It's a bad word. It's a, it's, in many ways, it's a bad word. Richard Louie, NBC News, Washington, D.C. Let's continue this conversation about the AAPI community with our weekly mental health check. And new reporting shows how some are turning to traditional alternatives to talk therapy. Yeah, plus how artificial intelligence is making its way into the mental health world. And it starts with our smartwatches. Let's bring in board certified psychiatrist Dr. Sue Varma to help break down these headlines. So, Dr. Varma, good to have you with us. Let's start with NBCNews.com report on how Asian Americans are turning to practices like yoga and Tai Chi mm. to help address mental health concerns. Why is it some Asian Americans are finding this more effective than Western therapy? And what might be some of the barriers the community is facing when looking for help? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, some of these more traditional therapies might be more welcome, um, more accessible, more affordable, um, more familiar, and also that they're community based, which for a lot of um, minority communities are less threatening. You know, a lot of the um, sort of psychiatric, psychoanalytic, psychological therapies were devised with Western values in mind. And um, this may not always be relatable. You know, for example, um, somebody from an Asian American background may say, you know, family has to come first. You know, my family doesn't agree with this. And Western values would say, well, you know, it really is about the individual and you're not being um, sort of assertive enough. And so sometimes there can be a cultural uh, clash and the therapist may not feel as if they fully understand the patient and the patient may not feel, feel fully understood. Um, language, of course, is also an issue. We see um, a lot of barrier and stigma and a lot of times um, Asian families are dropping out of therapy or not coming to therapy or treatment until um, the problem has been uh, exacerbated or is very severe. So I love the idea of traditional therapies being more accessible in the United States. Mm, such an important conversation to be having. And Dr. Varma, we mentioned this AI story as well. Researchers at Mount Sinai are looking to use artificial intelligence to monitor a patient's well-being. And this is all through their smart watches. Walk us through how that works and the end goal here, how that could actually help. Yeah. So in this study, there were um, a little bit less than 400 healthcare workers across um, seven uh, hospitals in New York City, and they're using Apple um, smartwatch series four or five, and they're gathering data such as heart rate va variability and baseline heart rate, as well as asking questions about resilience and optimism and emotional support, and hoping that together with this data that they're able to be able to predict things like resilience. Look, um, none of this is going to be, you know, 100% clear. There's not going to be necessarily a uh, causation, but we can be, be able to have what we call observational study information gathering where we can see, you know, is there some sort of correlation between these measures and uh, mental health, well-being, anxiety, depression, and of course the studies will expand with time. Dr. Barma, we quickly want to ask you about one more. We know we love a good social media trend on Morning News mm -hmm. now. This one's been circulating. It focuses on intrusive thoughts. Videos that show people doing crazy things and claiming they let their intrusive thoughts okay. in. So explain to us what those are and how we should actually manage those thoughts. Look, I love a good, good reel, but um, we have to be careful because intrusive thoughts really are like sort of a medical terminology that says that there's unwanted thoughts. Um, that could be anything from asking you to do something, to wash your hands. We see this in OCD. We see this in anxiety. Um, we can see this in postpartum mood and anxiety disorders where a woman may say, like, I'm having thoughts about something's going to harm my baby. Um, you want to get help. If you find that the intrusive thoughts are extremely distressing, um, that they don't fit with your worldview, they make you want to do things that you know are not right or make you feel uncomfortable or mm. talking about harm to yourself or to somebody else, or they're not intrusive thoughts, there might be voices, um, please get help. This is not something um, I would want to joke about or dismiss, um, even though, look, I do like sense of humor in therapy. All right. Dr. Subarma, thank you so much. Important point there. Thank you. Coming up on Morning News Now, gearing up for 2024. Two decorated Olympians join us here next with what it's like preparing for the Paralympics and what to expect from next summer's games in Paris. Stay with us. 
Welcome back. Paralympic athletes from around the world are preparing for next year's Paralympic Games. Over 4,000 of the world's top Paralympic athletes will come together in Paris, competing over 12 days. The event highlights all of the stellar athletes in the sport and helps to raise awareness about disability and inclusion. And we have two decorated athletes joining us this morning. We are so excited to have six-time Paralympian, 20-time Paralympic medalist in wheelchair track, Tatiana, <laughs> face, Tatiana McFadden and Brad Snyder, a three-time Paralympian and eight-time Paralympic medalist in the para triathlon and former swimmer as well. Good morning to both of you. We also have Mr. T here, by the way. We can't ignore Mr. <laughs> T Mr. as well. T. Right down here, but as Brad said, he won't be taking any questions. <laughs> Good morning to you both. We really appreciate you being here. And Tatiana, I will start with you because you are known as the fastest woman in the world. As I just said, 20-time medalist here. How are you preparing? We're about a year out, and how are you feeling? I'm really, really excited. Um, it's going to be a tough preparation. Mm -hmm. Next week I have track trials for world championships. We go to world championships in July. And then I'm going to turn around and focus on um, the major marathons this mm -hmm. fall with Berlin, Chicago, and New York. Wow. And then prepare for trials next year. Oh, I'm looking nice. forward to it. I'm ready to break some records. Yeah. Oh, there we go. A reminder that it's not just Olympic years. Competition is all yeah, the time, every exactly. single Good year. Point. Okay, so Brad, I have to read your list of accomplishments here. <laughs> you were recently named the SB winner for best athlete with a disability in men's sports. You became the first American Paralympian to win a triathlon. You've also medaled in Paralympic swimming. Talk to us about why the Paralympics are so important to hmm. you. Well, so I think that there's, there's two, two reasons that Paralympics are really important. One, inspiring youth with a disability. Mm -hmm. So, uh, like blind children don't have the same connection to a Michael Phelps that you and I maybe do. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I feel very prideful about my competition is hopefully there's a youth athlete who's watching me and saying, you know what, I can do that too. Uh, the second population is really important for is in society, I think there's a lot of gaps and misunderstandings about what the experience of a disabled person is. Uh, and Paralympics can help provide a platform for us to better understand each other, better understand the lexicon, better empathize with each other, and better include those with disabilities in everyday life. Wow, so incredible to hear you talk about inspiring others. Um, Tatiana, I know you have fought for, for similar things, as just mentioned, equality in sports that started actually all the way back in high school. You sued your school for the right to compete on the same track as non-disabled athletes. That is now known as Tatiana's Law. <laughs> just incredible work there. Walk us through what barriers people face today and also what else you'd like to see change. I mean, you've made change before. What would you like to see? I think it's providing education to people, um, and that's what was the most important thing about my lawsuit. Why was I really being discriminated? Mm -hmm. And the part is educating people about disability, one. The second is this about educating people what Paralympic mm -hmm. sport is, what wheelchair racing is, um, and then the third um, is the right for inclusion for people with disabilities. And that teaching still goes on today. I think there's such a great, um, I think if we can bring equality into sports, we can really bring equality back into our own communities for people with disabilities. So they can have a right to an education, they can have the right to get a job, mm -hmm. you know, they can have the right to travel around the world. And oftentimes people still don't have these rights or the voice or the platform to use it. So. I'm just honored that Brad and I are both here just to be a little bit of a voice um, for people with disabilities so they can have the right to do whatever they want to do. That is such a great message. Brad, you are a Navy veteran. We are so grateful for your mm -hmm. service. You lost your vision when you stepped on an IED in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about overcoming that to become an athlete, a successful athlete, and how your military training helped you with that. Sure. Yeah. Uh, the. The, the, the rehabilitation process after my injury had a lot less to do with blindness. You know, learning how to navigate your world without being able to see is, is one thing. It's certainly challenging, uh, but it's not the first time I had done that. Uh, you said my military training, you know, we often work at night. I, also, I was a scuba diver. We'd dive underneath ships where there's no light. So I was familiar with how to navigate without being able to see. What was really challenging was going from a person who had all these capabilities, hmm. jumping out of aircraft, scuba diving, taking apart bombs, being a part of an assault team in Afghanistan, I felt like there was nothing I couldn't do. And all of a sudden, I was on the exact opposite end of that spectrum, where almost everything was insurmountably difficult. Mm -hmm. So I really had to navigate a sense of identity. How do I refine 
my self-worth, refine my sense of confidence. And sports was the platform where that I was able to do that. Just starting with something as basic as swimming back and forth in the pool without being able to see eventually escalated to competing on the, the grandest sports stage in the world in the Paralympics. And for me, it was a way to rebuild that sense of identity. Uh, and, it, and now I'm extremely passionate about making sure, following her lead on, Tatiana's lead on, making sure that opportunity's out there for anybody like me who needs it. Absolutely. We only have time for just a little bit from each of you, but I would like to hear from both of you on this in just 20 seconds or so. What do you want Americans to know about the Paralympics? I'll start with you, Tatiana. Wow, um, that it's parallel to the Olympics. I think there's uh, that confusion and, and that barrier. Um, we receive the same uniforms, we stay at the same mm. place, same medals, um, same sponsorships. We all represent Team USA. Now we get equal pay that yep, started in Tokyo. Right. So yeah. um, it's exactly the same. It's the parallel to the Olympics. That's oh. right. I just want America to be inspired. Mm. Oh. You both inspire us. Absolutely. And you get to go to Paris. So yeah. right. <laughs> How cool is that? Yeah, amazing. Tatiana, Brad, Mr. T as well, thank you so much for joining us this morning, spending some time with us in the studio. We appreciate it. We can't wait to watch. Thank you. Right Good luck. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. absolutely. We'd love to have you back, too. And, of course, you'll be able to watch the Paris Paralympics next summer on NBC and Peacock. Coming up, we have got the top list of cities that you should visit. That is next on Morning News Now, and look what it is. Paris. <laughs> <laughs> what a spot. <laughs> Welcome back. You may remember an interview a couple of weeks ago on this show with a 16-year-old high school senior who had received a whopping $10 million Ooh. in scholarship offers from 149 schools. Well, now <laughs> senior Dennis Malik Barnes from New Orleans has made his choice, officially announcing he will attend Cornell University in Ithaca, New York, plans to study computer science and then practice software development and then world domination after that. <laughs> Congratulations to him. We are so excited for that. That is awesome. Well, summer is just around the corner, and if you haven't booked your vacation yet, we've got some tips for you. That is because the U.S. News & World Report has just released this year's best vacation rankings. From the bright lights of Tokyo to Ooh. the wilderness of Montana, ah. there's a destination for everyone on this year's list. U.S. News senior travel editor Elizabeth Von Terst joins us now to unveil some of those top destinations. Elizabeth, good morning. So let's start with the international list for those who are looking to get out of America for a little bit. Where should they be looking? Any cities new to the list this year? Of course. Good morning. So this year we're really seeing that people are ready to take those bucket list trips after years of uncertainty. Um, so you're going to see that reflected in some iconic European cities, uh, Paris, Rome, London, mm. but also some hard to reach islands like Bora Bora and the Maldives. Um, so new to our world's best list this year, uh, we're really excited to have the Swiss Alps, Amsterdam, wow. Uh, Tulum, Tasmania, and the British Virgin Islands. Oh, so some I love that. Yeah, yes. I'm headed to Paris next week. Well, there you go. There number you go. one on the I'm list. I'm number one, baby. There you go. <laughs> All right. What destination should we be looking at if we're looking to stay in the States this year, though? Of course. So a very exciting update to our uh, best places to visit in the USA. Glacier National Park is number one for the very first time ever. Uh, so that's uh, very exciting. Um, Maui and the Grand Canyon also round out that top three. Um, we also have a list of the best small towns to visit in the U.S. So if you're mm. looking to kind of get away from the crowds a little bit, um, you'll see Bar Harbor, Telluride, and Monterey on those oh, lists, oh, too. Telluride's amazing. Something. I want to go to all these places now. All right. We know airfare, though, skyrocketing right oh. now. Folks trying to make summer plans, dealing with that. Oh, are there some cities in the U.S., even Europe, that are a little more affordable? Yeah. Yes, of course. So we do have our cheap U.S. lists and cheap Europe lists for vacations. Um, so in the U.S., you're going to see a lot of them center around national parks. They tend to offer an amazing value uh, with camping and, of course, the low mm -hmm. entry fees. Um, but then you'll also see some kind of low-key towns like Cannon Beach, Oregon, uh, where a lot of their best uh, activities are going to be free as well. Um, and then in Europe, we do have some exciting cities too. So Porto, uh, Portugal, uh, Prague, Czech Republic, and mm. Valencia, Spain round out the top three there. 
Um, and another plus, along with having cheaper activities and accommodations, is that they typically tend to be a little bit less crowded than some of those major Europe destinations. All right, some great advice there. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth Von Tersch, thanks so much for joining us this morning and getting our travel bug yeah, getting going us again. Yeah, excited. All right. Thank you. That Thank you for, for having me. That is it for this hour of morning news now. But the news continues right now, so stay with us. Good morning, everyone. We're happy you're here. I'm Savannah Sellers. And I'm Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, disturbing new information about the 33-year-old man accused of killing eight people at a mall near Dallas. The alarming social media posts that have been uncovered appearing to belong to the gunman as this latest mass shooting reignites a heated national debate over gun control. And a shock community mourns those who were killed, including three children. Also, a moving vigil in Brownsville overnight honoring the eight lives lost there in a tragic crash over the weekend. The suspect now facing manslaughter charges. We've got the latest on that investigation, plus the stories of survival as tensions flare ahead of the lifting of a COVID-era border restriction later this week. In Washington, the stage is set for a high-stakes meeting over a looming financial crisis. President Biden set to meet with top lawmakers from Capitol Hill to try and reach a deal on raising the debt ceiling. We'll take a look at what could happen if the U.S. defaults on those debts, possibly just weeks from now, what it all means for your money. And heat culture. They are setting the NBA playoffs ablaze with some stunning wins and an all-star roster of league veterans and undrafted players. So what is the secret to Miami's success in the paint this season? <laughs> well, according to the team, you've just got to believe. Sounds like Ted Lasso right there. Yeah. You've just got to believe. <laughs> it works for all the sports. <laughs> Take a closer look at that in a little bit. We are going to start this hour with the disturbing new information we are learning about the gunman who killed eight people at a mall near Dallas. A social media page appearing to belong to the 33-year-old shooter is filled with extremist, racist, and anti-Semitic views. NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa is in Allen, Texas this morning covering the very latest. Hey, Maggie, good morning. Hey, Savannah, Joe, good morning. Yeah, that troubling social media account that you're talking about is actually on a Russian social networking site. And a senior law enforcement official telling NBC News it is absolutely paramount to their investigation. And this, as this community continues to try and cope with this senseless loss of life. This morning, investigators in Texas zeroing in on disturbing social media posts that appear to belong to the nation's latest mass shooter, 33-year-old Mauricio Garcia. The online activity on a Russian social platform includes vile rants against women and minorities, along with a series of shirtless pictures that show visible white power tattoos. Garcia, who also posted online about struggling with his mental health, published this video the day of the attack that shows him wearing a scream mask. This as more about the shooter's background comes into view. An Army spokesperson telling NBC News Garcia joined the Army in 2008 but did not complete basic training and was kicked out after three months for an unspecified physical or mental condition. Electronic receipts posted on the shooter's social media account appear to show he spent more than $3,200 on firearms. Authorities say Garcia was wearing a tactical vest and was armed with multiple weapons, including an AR-15 style rifle and a handgun. This latest mass shooting fueling new calls for gun control, but Texas Governor Greg Abbott suggesting the problem is not guns. People want a quick solution. The long-term solution here uh, is to address the mental health issue. While Democratic state legislators in Texas say the problem is obvious. No, Greg Abbott, it's guns. It's gone. Does that suspect have an AR rifle? Law enforcement sources say this surveillance video shows Garcia opening fire on innocent shoppers Saturday. He was killed by a police officer being hailed as a hero. Overnight, an attorney saying the officer is doing well, adding he's a brave servant with a gentle heart. Meanwhile, an outpouring of grief at a memorial for the eight innocent lives lost. Three of the victims, young children from two different North Texas families. Three-year-old James Cho killed along with his parents, Cindy and Q, his six-year-old brother, William, the only member of the family to survive. The Mendoza family losing 11-year-old Daniela and eight-year-old Sophia, their mother, in critical condition.
The other victims, 32-year-old Elio Cumana Rivas, 26-year-old Ashwaria Tetacondia, and 23-year-old security guard Christian LaCour. And with those victims and their families in mind, we do want to bring it back to one more detail from those social media posts. Authorities telling us that in the weeks leading up to this attack, they say Garcia posted more than two dozen photos of the Allen Premium outlets, and they say he may have been monitoring this mall during its busiest times. Joe, Savannah. Oh, just heartbreaking there to hear about those victims. Maggie Vespa, thank you so much. There are new developments this morning in the investigation into that deadly crash in the border town of Brownsville, Texas. Eight people were killed, some of them migrants. The driver has now been charged with manslaughter, and while a motive has not been determined, this comes as cities along the border brace for an influx of migrants. That's because a COVID-era immigration policy is set to expire later this week. NBC News national correspondent Gabe Gutierrez is in Brownsville with the latest. Joe, good morning. That deadly crash has left this community completely stunned. And this all comes as tensions remain high along the southern border as Title 42 is now set to expire on Thursday. Meanwhile, here in Brownsville, three of the 10 injured migrants have just been released from the hospital. And we're now hearing from one of the victims for the first time. An emotional vigil for the victims of Sunday's horrifying crash as the suspect now faces manslaughter charges for ramming a group of Venezuelan migrants outside a shelter. <laughs> Family members in agony as they learn their loved ones were among the dead. Gabriel Gallardo, one of the survivors, lost a leg. <laughs> My dreams are broken. They're gone, he says, from his hospital bed. <laughs> With his two children, his wife desperate, begging President Biden for help. George Alvarez is now facing eight counts of manslaughter and 10 counts of aggravated assault. Police believe Alvarez lost control of his SUV after running a red light, plowing into the group, killing eight people. Investigators have not ruled out the crash was intentional. George Alvarez is a Bronzo local with an extensive rap sheet. This man, who says he witnessed the crash, tells us the driver appeared drunk and yelled, anti-immigrant profanities, though police have not substantiated that and are still waiting for toxicology results. How is this community doing right now? They're getting it shaken up. I don't think any of us have experienced something like this. The migrant deaths come as tensions ramp up here ahead of the lifting Thursday night of the COVID border restriction known as Title 42, which is expected to bring yet another migrant influx. In just the past 72 hours, the Border Patrol chief says there have been more than 26,000 illegal crossings. Texas's Republican governor now deploying more specialized National Guard troops, while Arizona's Democratic governor is also planning to send in more resources. We cannot manage this influx alone without much more robust action from the federal government. Busloads of migrants keep arriving in northern cities and now are even pitting some New York suburbs against the city. Rockland County declaring a state of emergency, slamming New York City Mayor Eric Adams for planning to send several hundred migrants to hotels there. It's a farce and it will not happen on our watch. Back here in Brownsville, several of the migrants we spoke to describe a dramatic scene where they detain the suspect until police arrive. Now, that suspect, George Alvarez, once again, is being held on $3.6 million bail. He has not yet entered a plea, and it's unclear if he has an attorney. Joe, back to you. All right, Gabe, thank you so much. And now to the looming financial crisis here in the U.S. that could have an impact around the world. Congressional leaders are expected to meet with President Biden today to discuss the debt ceiling with hopes of avoiding a potentially catastrophic default for the first time in U.S. history. We'll have more on that meeting in just a moment from NBC's Kristen Walker at the White House. But first, we want to take a closer look at what is at stake. Here's NBC News business and data reporter Brian Chung. The debt ceiling concerns the amount we owe as a nation. And here's how much the U.S. Treasury has issued in debt. So think U.S. bonds and notes. And Congress sets limits, a.k.a. ceilings, on the accumulation of this debt. The current ceiling is $31 trillion, which we've already blown through. Now, it's important to note that the debt ceiling doesn't address how much we spend or where we spend. It's a cap on how much we're able to cover on bills we've already racked up. So what happens now? The Treasury says we can probably only keep the lights on through June 1st. After that, we might be unable to pay the bills, at which point we may have to start choosing where we can keep the money flowing. That means Social Security, Medicare, food stamps might be at risk. Then there's the risk of our reputation. 
The U.S. takes pride in its creditworthiness since we have historically paid our bills on time. Our credit rating as a nation could fall if we don't. And that would lead to a spike in interest rates as financial markets turn away from our government's debt. As a benchmark for borrowing costs, this can make it more expensive for all of us to get credit for things like houses or cars. And the ultimate concern here would be default, where the government starts to straight up miss payments on what it owes the many people, businesses, and governments owning U.S. debt. All the other things get worse in that case, so even higher interest rates, more ratings downgrades, more government program cuts. And none of this has happened before because Congress has moved to raise or suspend the debt ceiling in the last 78 times we've faced this. We'll see if that becomes 79. All right, Brian Chung, thank you for that report. Very helpful. Let's bring in NBC News Chief White House Correspondent Kristen Welker with more on this. Kristen, good morning. So as we mentioned, the president is meeting with congressional leaders today there at the White House. As Brian just showed us, there's a lot at stake. So what can we expect from this meeting? I mean, how likely is it we're going to see progress here today? Doesn't seem very likely, Joe and Savannah. Look, this has become the highest of high stakes game of chicken. And so far, it's just not clear there's going to be a major breakthrough today. So here's the issue. President Biden has said he's not going to negotiate over the debt limit. He cites the fact that Congress has agreed to raise it without strings attached in many cases during the Trump administration when Republicans did not enact new spending cuts. But now Republicans say they won't do so without some cuts, something the White House has already shot down, at least as a part of this negotiation. Negotiation. So the bottom line is all eyes will be on today's meeting with pressure mounting on President Biden and Republican House Speaker Kevin McCarthy to reach a deal. Not overstated to say both of their jobs could be on the line here. Of course, McCarthy has that narrow majority in the House. And of course, President Biden has announced he's running for re-election. So a lot at stake for everyone involved here, guys. The clock is ticking. We're a little more than three weeks from that deadline. So where do negotiations go after today's meeting, do we think? Boy, that's a big question mark, Joe. After today's meeting, I anticipate both sides are going to go back to see what they can sell to their respective parties. Something has got to give here. While we expect the White House to go into talks today, basically asking for a long-term extension, something through 2024, for example, our sources who are familiar with these discussions also say no one has ruled out the possibility of a short-term extension, potentially one that goes through the fall and that times out exactly with the appropriations discussions, that would allow them to basically raise the debt limit and then have parallel negotiations about some spending cuts. But look, both sides seem really dug in at this point and unified, so it's not clear who blinks first. And Chris, I want to ask you about something that people are hearing a little bit about, and that's potentially using the 14th Amendment to avoid a devastating default for those of us who are years or even decades removed from social studies classes or poli-sci <laughs> classes. Remind us what this amendment is, what it does, and what are the chances that it would actually be utilized here? Well, the 14th Amendment, Joe, basically would allow the president to raise the debt limit or take this issue off the table himself, is a better way of saying it. And top administration officials, including the president himself, have not ruled out invoking the 14th Amendment, which, as I say, would basically allow the president to unilaterally say the nation has to pay its debt. However, and this is the big however, there's a big debate about the legality of that move. And even Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen herself warned it could be a constitutional crisis and that there's no way to protect the financial system, the economy, other than Congress increasing the debt limit. So this is really a high stakes moment, guys. All right. Thanks for the explanation there, Kristen. Thanks, Appreciate Jill. it. Well, Russia is marking the annual Victory Day, commemorating the defeat of Nazi Germany in the Second World War. The somber occasion remembers the millions of Russians who died during that conflict. Earlier this morning, President Putin addressed crowds during the military parade, which appeared scaled down compared with previous years. NBC News Chief Foreign Correspondent Richard Engel joins us now for more on this. Hi, Richard. Good morning. Well, it was very much scaled down. In fact, uh, foreign journalists, the few foreign journalists who are still operating in Russia, weren't allowed to go. Large crowds were kept at a distance. So Vladimir Putin was out celebrating Victory Day, but not on the same scale as previous years. It's the most important and solemn day in Russia, Victory Day over the Nazis in World War II. Russia lost more than 20 million soldiers and civilians in what is known across Russia as the Great Patriotic War. Today in Red Square, 
President Vladimir Putin says Russia is being pushed into another war by the West in neighboring Ukraine, a country he invaded a year ago without provocation. We do not have a nation we consider our enemy here in the West or the East, but they are provoking conflict and encouraging Russophobia. The speech lasted 10 angry minutes, flanked by his few remaining loyal allies from Belarus and Central Asia. President Putin presented himself as the guardian of Mother Russia and, as he does now frequently, of culture. They destroy traditional family values, which make a man a man, all for the purpose of continuing to dictate and impose their own will, he said. But the celebrations in Moscow were scaled back from previous years, coming just days after an alleged drone attack on the Kremlin that Kyiv denies carrying out. And as Russian troops on the front lines in Ukraine are pulling back to defensive positions and evacuating some civilians ahead of an upcoming Ukrainian offensive. Ukraine's President Zelensky, in a move to further align his country to the West, changed the date Ukraine celebrates the defeat of Nazi Germany to May 8th, like it's marked in Europe and the United States. Like back then, evil has returned to our cities and villages, although it is another aggressor. The goal is the same, enslavement or destruction, he said. World War II ended 78 years ago, but its shadow looms large today over the biggest conflict in Europe ever since. Russia carried out more airstrikes over Kyiv uh, overnight and fired cruise missiles at the city of Odessa, although Ukrainian officials say most of them were either shot down or missed their targets. Savannah. All right, Richard Engel, thank you so much. Time now for a check at your morning news now weather. Which means it's time for Angie Lassman to come back with us with your forecast. Hey, Angie. Hey, guys. Good morning. Well, how about uh, some temperatures in the mid-90s for some springtime in Amarillo? It's going to be way warm for this time of year. And that's not just the case there. It's across much of parts of the plains into the southeast. We're running above normal in Nashville and Atlanta, ending up into those mid-80s. It'll be quite warm as well for Jackson, Mississippi today at 87 degrees. Looking ahead to tomorrow, warmth takes shape over parts of the Midwest as well. Chicago headed to the upper 70s. Omaha will hit 79 degrees and still hanging on to those mid 80s for folks in Wichita. This goes as far south as Memphis and we'll keep that warmth in place at least for a little while longer. By the time we get into the end of the week, Thursday and say Friday, we're making our way to the 80s in some spots across the uh, northeast and into the mid-Atlantic. Mid 80s for Richmond, 87 degrees for Saturday. So it'll be a little warm over the next couple of days and even into the weekend, but we're also tracking some rain and it comes in a couple of rounds. Here's the lay of the land right now. We have a central plains dealing with some of these showers that are working into parts of the northern plains as well. The mid-Atlantic and parts of the east coast picking up on some rain as well through the Appalachians. But we have plenty of heavy rain that we're expecting into parts of Texas over the next day or so. Really, the next couple of days we could pick up on a couple more rounds of this heavy rain. And that's leading us to the, the issue of some flooding concerns. Here's the rainfall amounts. You notice that into the plains we'll see anywhere from an inch to two inches widespread a quarter of an inch or even a half an inch. But focused around the Houston metro area, that's where we'll see the potential for upwards of five inches of rain. And again, this is going to be impressive in the fact that we'll have hourly rainfall rates that could be upwards of two and a half inches per hour. So we'll be keeping a close eye on that again around the Houston metro area. We know that the soils are saturated. We know Houston has issues with flooding. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see some of that flash flooding here over the next couple of days. Here's the flash flood risk for today. We are seeing a moderate risk. That's that pink that you'll notice is surrounding all of Houston, but extending into Lake Charles and Corpus Christi, we'll still have the potential to see some flash flooding concerns there as well. And on top of that, we have some severe weather potential that goes through the day today into parts of uh, the Carolinas and into Virginia, but also through parts of the Plains. We'll continue to see that the potential for a uh, baseball size hail into the afternoon and evening hours tonight. And then tomorrow, don't let your guard down either. If you live near the Rockies, this is where we'll watch for the wind gusts to be brought Problematic, maybe up to 60 miles per hour. Hail, not so, uh, not as big, quite as big as what we'll have to deal with today, but still damaging hail possible, possible and even a couple of tornadoes. And that severe threat doesn't go away for tomorrow either. We'll end up uh, looking like we'll uh, have some, uh, some severe weather uh, across parts of that area, guys. So it'll be, you know, a couple of days where we'll have to deal with the uh, 
the, the potential for some some strong storms across many areas. Yeah, the plains. baseball size hail always. Yeah, just that'll hurt you. Crazy, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Thanks, Angie. Appreciate it. Thank you. Coming up on Morning News Now, a new legal challenge for golf legend Tiger Woods. Just ahead, we'll have more on the hearing scheduled for today over that controversial non-disclosure agreement between Woods and his ex-girlfriend. That is next. We're back with a look at the legal controversy surrounding golf superstar Tiger Woods. The $30 million legal battle with his ex-girlfriend Erica Herman is reaching a new boiling point. Herman filed new documents against Woods in her NDA dispute accusing the top golfer of sexual harassment. NBC News contributing correspondent Kaylee Hartung has the latest. Hey there, so the case will be presented in a Florida court today where Tiger Woods lawyers will ask a judge to enforce a non-disclosure agreement between him and his ex Erica Herman, including a clause that would keep this legal battle out of the public eye. But she's bringing new evidence to support her claims. This morning, the latest legal fallout from Tiger Woods' relationship with his ex-girlfriend Erica Herman. Woods and Herman began dating in 2015 while Herman was an employee at his Florida restaurant, The Woods Jupiter. According to court documents, Woods forced her to sign an NDA or else be fired from her job. Her team claims Woods, who was Herman's boss at the time, imposed an NDA on her as a condition to keep her job when she began having a sexual relationship with him. A boss imposing different work conditions on his employee because of their sexual relationship is sexual harassment. Sexual harassment is often about power differential at work. You can't imagine a bigger power differential than an employee at Tiger Woods Restaurant, which bears his name. Herman arguing the sexual harassment invalidates the NDA. In a 2017 email included in the filing, Herman raised concerns about the agreement with Woods' business manager, writing in part, If by chance TW does something that brings our relationship to an end, do I automatically lose my job? I don't have any problems with what's in the document, but with my whole life in his hands now, if something happened, I don't want to be in my 40s, heartbroken and jobless. Herman is also asking the court to deny the cause compelling arbitration and is suing Woods Trust for $30 million in a separate case where she claims Woods kicked her out of his home where they lived together until October of last year, their breakup making headlines. According to Herman, Woods told her he planned a last minute getaway for them to the Bahamas, but instead, she says they were met at the airport by a lawyer who informed her she would never see Woods or his home again. For now, the personal life of the famously private Woods playing out publicly in a courtroom drama. It's still unclear if Tiger will be joining his lawyers for the hearing. He's reportedly still recovering from a surgery on his ankle last month, so it's unlikely we think that he'll make an appearance. But all eyes will be on that Florida courtroom to see where things go from here. Representatives for Woods and Herman did not respond to NBC News' request for comment. Joining, Joining us now for more insight on this is attorney and legal analyst Angela Senadella. Angela, always great to have you with us. Thank you so much for joining. So attorneys for Tiger Woods are expected in court today in an effort really to just get this complaint against him halted. Walk us through what that means and then what it is that the court has to decide in the suit. Yes, yeah, so at the heart of it, what Tiger Woods attorneys want is for everything to be private. Right. That's what he wants. They want nothing to come out publicly. So what they are saying here is that any litigation should be done in private arbitration, should not be done in a court of law. And their basis for this is the NDA that Erica Herman signed. And in that NDA was an arbitration clause. So he's saying, look, this should be, this, this argument should be upheld because it was between two people and it was personal. It has nothing to do with the employer-employee relationship. Mm. But as we know, courts will look at that with a side eye. They will say, look, even if this was personal, at the heart of it, she is your employee and those things conflate so she's mm. trying to get out of this nda help us understand how sexual harassment plays yes. into this because that might be confusing to a lot yes of so this is very relevant as of january 2023 mm. there was a new federal law that was just signed in and what that federal law does is it nullifies and declares void any nda that was signed prior to a dispute over sexual harassment. So you can understand the public policy reasons here. You might sign a blanket NDA and then some sort of abuse or alleged harassment happens and you don't want to have your voice silenced forever. So under that act, her lawyers are claiming that this NDA no longer applies mm. because there's a dispute here. There's a separate lawsuit also. Let's walk through the details of this one that Herman's filed $30 million. This is against the trust that owns Wood's beachfront mansion. It alleges that Wood's kicked her out after promising she could live there. What is she basing that on? What is $30 million based on? And what will she have to prove to win that? 
So the $30 million damages is very high, but it's based here off of distress and, and fraud and a breach of contract. But the real problem with this argument is that it's based off of an oral promise. So she's saying that mm. he claimed to her just orally, but there's no written proof. And this is why, as a lawyer, we tell all of our clients, get everything in writing. I think this will be difficult to litigate on her side. Mm. Oh, you do? I okay. do. Well, there we go. Angela Sanadella, thank you so much. Now to some international news. New this morning, the former prime minister of Pakistan has been arrested. Let's bring in NBC News foreign correspondent Claudio Lavanga joining us from Rome with that and more. Hey, Claudio, good morning. Savannah so, Joe, good morning. Yes, it's a senior official within the party of Imran Khan who said that the former prime minister of Pakistan has been arrested this morning uh, in the capital Islamabad while he was in a court uh, facing charges of graft. Now, the official said also that Khan was dragged out of the court and into a police vehicle and called the arrest an abduction. Imran Khan was forced to step down after he lost the confidence vote in April last year and has since claimed his ouster was illegal and was the result of a Western conspiracy. Now, the city of Auckland in New Zealand has declared a state of emergency after torrential rain caused widespread flooding on Tuesday. The heavy rain, which filled basements, stranded cars, toppled trees and disrupted rail services, is expected to last, to last at least until Wednesday. Rescue teams are also searching for a high school student missing in a flooded cave north of the city. New Zealand Meteorological Service said that since January, the Auckland region received 90% of its average total annual rainfall. And finally, take a look at this. It's going to be the largest 3D printed building in Europe. The construction, or rather the printing, has started on March 31st, and the building's walls are being printed at a rate of about 43 square feet per hour. Very impressive. Now, when completed, the building will be 6,600 square feet and stand at 30 feet high and will be used as a data management and cloud services center. Now, buildings being printed, that's quite incredible guys yeah no okay. kidding <laughs> my <laughs> incredible Inc yeah i got it. <laughs> <laughs> my printer doesn't do that it, we, it can barely got, do yeah. a sheet of paper All we right. appreciate the, the forced funds every time claudia <laughs> thank love you, claudia. it thank you all right coming up an unbelievable story of survival out of michigan get this a second grader just eight years old went missing in the woods for two days in the cold but was just found safe and sound we'll tell you how he was able to do it in just a moment also after the break birth control could soon be available without a prescription. We're going to take you inside the FDA vote today on approving a widely used drug for over-the-counter use. This is Morning News Now. We are back with an incredible survival story, a brave second grader who put his skills to work after getting lost while camping. The eight-year-old disappeared from his family's Michigan campsite over the weekend, prompting a massive search. NBC News correspondent Ann Thompson joins us now with more on how he was found safe and sound. Ann, good morning. Good morning, Joe. This is really a remarkable story. The area where the boy disappeared is extremely remote and hilly. But this eight-year-old was able to find shelter for himself and give searchers clues leading to an amazing rescue. This morning, a miraculous rescue and a grateful family. An eight-year-old boy who went missing in the Michigan woods for two days, fighting through cold and rough terrain by hunkering down under a log, found alive and safe Monday. Michigan State Police say Nante Nimi was walking and gathering firewood while camping with his family in the Porcupine Mountains Wilderness State Park when he disappeared Saturday afternoon. More than 150 search and rescue personnel spent days combing through a roughly 40 square mile area, finally finding Nante about two miles from his campsite. They found the second grader determined a little bit dirty, but okay, as they guided him to safety. And all I see is this little tiny uh, white sweatshirt and he goes, Eli? And I, I just ran up over to him and I gave him the biggest hug and I was so relieved once I saw him. The boy's mother saying he fought to get back to us the entire time, adding that he made a shelter to sleep each night, making tracks purposely, cleared off dirty snow to eat the clean stuff. A community now celebrating dedicated rescuers and an extraordinarily resourceful young boy. 
That is one smart eight-year-old. Nante's mom uh, is also thanking the rescuers this morning, writing, instead of shock, I'm realizing just how lucky we are. To say it's humbling is an understatement. Mm -hmm. Joe, that's a good way to start your day. No kidding. <laughs> My goodness. Good for that young man. Wow, good to incredible. see. He's doing okay. Thank you, Ann. Appreciate that. Well, the FDA is preparing to vote on whether birth control pills should be switched from a prescription drug to over-the-counter. Perigo submitted its application to sell its long-approved drug, O-Pill, without a prescription. If approved, it would be the first contraceptive to be sold over-the-counter. But regulators have expressed serious concerns about making the drug more accessible to the public. NBC News senior medical correspondent Dr. John Torres joins us now for more on this. It's always great to see you, Dr. Torres. Thanks for being here. So give us some insight into the FDA discussion here. What is it that they're looking for in order to make a decision on this? So this is the advisory panel that advises the FDA. They usually go with the recommendations, but don't always mm. take the recommendations. Sometimes they make decisions independent of that. But what the panel is looking at, and these are experts in the various fields, particularly in obstetrics and gynecology right now, they're looking at this prescription pill, which has been a prescription since the 1970s. It's been around. It's have a very good safety record, and it's something that a lot of women use for birth control, and they're saying, should we move this to over-the-counter? In other words, same dosing, same everything, but but it's available without a prescription. They're weighing a couple of things here. One is, you know, the safety behind it. Again, mm. it's very safe, but there are some side effects behind it. And will people be able to take it like they're supposed to take it without the doctor's or the physician assistant's advice saying, here's how you're supposed to take it? Mm. That's what they're going to be looking at the next couple of days. A couple of key questions here. Any age restrictions? And then what's the cost going to be? Answers to those. And then are, are these issues that are already questions with the existing ways we get birth control. And right now, as far as age restrictions with prescriptions, there really no, are no age restrictions with it. And so a doctor can give it to someone once they start, you know, they start getting into the age where they could get pregnant. So they need to figure out, can they do that with mm. the over-the-counter ones as well? Can they bring it down or are they going to restrict it to 18 or 21-year-olds and saying anybody below that might be an issue? Advocates are saying you need to push it down to that age because they can get pregnant and there are a lot of unwanted pregnancies in that age group as well. As far as costs, we don't know. But one thing we do know is in the past with over-the-counter medications, once they turn over the counter, oftentimes insurance companies don't cover them. And so that's a big concern as well because then will the cost be affordable? So right now we're talking about the FDA approval of this, you know, this regulatory within the, the medical uh, concerns or lack thereof with the sexual medication. But how does this factor into the current debate and conversation we see going on about abortion access? And that's one of the big concerns and one of the big questions. You know, if they do say, yes, it's over the counter, that would be a federal over the counter across the country uh, mandate. Now what happens when the states start stepping in, especially the states that have restricted abortion access, are they going to say, no, you cannot have that? over the counter here and then I think that's going to start heading towards the mm. courts of saying you know who has jurisdiction the federal or the state governments as far as what can be and can't be over the counter in their states. Mm. All right, Dr. John Torres, thank you so much. You Appreciate bet. it. Thank you. Always good to see you. Well, we've heard the warnings about kids and social media. Well, now there are new guidelines this morning for how your teens and tweens can create healthy boundaries while on social media. Today's show anchor Jenna Bush Hager has more. Across the U.S., nearly every teen says they've used social media in some form this past year. And this morning, the American Psychological Association released new guidelines to help them learn healthy behaviors online. Among the 10 recommendations, adult monitoring for kids ages 10 to 14 using social platforms, routine screenings for signs of problematic use, and adolescents avoiding apps for social comparison, particularly around beauty, or appearance-related content. Conversations many parents, like Ray Kilmer in upstate New York, are already having. His three kids, including 15-year-old Elizabeth, don't get cell phones until eighth grade. The now ninth grader has some restrictions, including a time limit for TikTok, blocked videos, and her phone is kept downstairs after bedtime clearly outline what her expectations are for her, and then she understands what the consequences are if she doesn't meet those. It's made me feel like I have more responsibility because, like, I know that they trust me with that stuff. Keeping kids safe online, a growing national discussion. From here on today, where actress Jennifer Garner told Hoda and Savannah she's keeping her three kids off social media. I just said to my kids, tell me, show me the articles that that prove that social media is good for teenagers, and then we'll have the conversation. Oh. How do they feel at this point? Uh, my eldest is grateful. 
to Capitol Hill, where a bipartisan group of senators introduced new legislation in April. Their proposal aims to ban kids under 13 from signing up for social media platforms and requires parental consent for 13 to 17 year olds to use popular apps like TikTok and Instagram. This comes as more studies show how being plugged in on social can impact mental health. A recent CDC study shows nearly three in five teenage girls feel sad or hopeless. One reason the report suggests because 16% of high school students, most likely girls, are electronically bullied through texting or social platforms like Instagram and Facebook. And just last week, the Surgeon General's advisory on loneliness suggests an increase in online versus in-person interactions is making Americans feel more isolated. Sometimes they feel worse when they see people doing things without them. But for Elizabeth, she says her relationship with social media is overall a positive one. Sometimes it's like I get to the point where I know I've been on it too much. I just need to like balance it sometimes. Our thanks to Jenna Bush Hager for that report. Well, here's one more social media guideline everyone, not just teens, can use. Make sure your social media scrolling doesn't interfere with your sleep schedule and physical activity. Set a plan and create time to switch it off. Great advice there. Coming up, reparations are back in the spotlight in California as the state debates what exactly is owed to descendants of slaves who live there. And in light of that debate, one family is digging a little deeper into their own roots, which could prove valuable. We'll have that story for you next. The task force in California voted over the weekend approving recommendations for how the state may compensate black Californians for generations of harm caused by slavery and racism. NBC News correspondent Dana Griffin shares one family's journey toward discovering their own history. 62-year-old Denise Green has lived in Southern California her entire life. This is my grandmother right here. She knows her ancestors came from Mississippi, but much of her family history was unknown. That is, until her niece started doing research. Here's the 1880 census. Adrian Aviodon is a professional genealogist in Tampa, Florida. But even she spent two decades and thousands of dollars before uncovering the name Philip Branch. So Philip Branch is my fourth great-grandfather, and he was an enslaved person. What was your reaction when Adrian told you that your family is direct descendants of an enslaved person named Philip Branch. <laughs> I thought that was awesome. It was just a little overwhelming. The vital lineage information could be valuable in California as it debates what is owed to descendants of the enslaved. Camila Moore is chair of the California Reparations Task Force, the first in the nation statewide effort to address systemic racism against African Americans caused by the enduring legacy of slavery. Could it be something as simple as you take a cheek swab, you submit your DNA, and they go, oh, you're a descendant of an enslaved person. Here's your check. <laughs> I mean, it could be. Again, this is all still a work in progress. The task force wants eligibility to be lineage-based versus race-based. That has sparked debate. The paper trail is not always proven to be correct. For people who have to prove their lineage, it can be difficult, costly, and time-consuming especially since many slaves weren't identified by name, but property codes up until the 1870 census. People think that, oh, I'm going to sit down and do my family research this weekend and, and get my application for reparations ready. That's not going to happen. Over the weekend, the task force approved recommendations for reparations that could be worth up to 1.2 million for eligible applicants. Citywide reparations efforts are also underway in Boston, St. Louis, and San Francisco. Some may not support the idea because it could cost taxpayer dollars. Denise doesn't know if she'll ever get reparations, but she supports the Golden State's effort. I'm excited for people who, you know, will need it and can use it. But the sad part is we're getting it at the expense of what our ancestors went through. Dana Griffin. NBC News, Los Angeles. Now let's get to some financial news. Goldman Sachs is settling a longtime class action lawsuit over workplace bias against women. CNBC markets reporter Pippa Stevens joins us with that and other money news. Pippa, good morning. 
Good morning. Well, Goldman Sachs has agreed to pay $215 million to settle a class action lawsuit alleging widespread bias against women. Former employees accused Goldman of systematically paying women less than men and giving them weaker performance reviews, blocking their career growth. The settlement covers about 2,800 female associates and vice presidents in investment banking, asset management, and securities trading. Meanwhile, Tesla breaks ground on a massive lithium refinery in Texas. CEO Elon Musk says the facility could produce enough of the critical battery metal to build about 1 million electric vehicles by 2025. It will also push Tesla outside of its core business of making cars into the complex area of refining and processing. But it's a step Musk says is necessary if Tesla wants to meet its sales targets. China dominates global processing of lithium and other key EV metals. And Disney is ditching some of its pandemic-era ticket policies at its Orlando theme parks. Starting in January, visitors who buy a dated ticket to Disney w w will not have to make a reservation to one of its four theme parks. That's Magic Kingdom, Epcot, Animal Kingdom, and Hollywood Studios. Disney has required people to make reservations as a way to control crowds. The company says the changes are based on customer feedback. I guess everyone wants to hop around the park, so don't want to be held back by those reservations. Yeah. Yeah, freedom, go wherever you'd like. Yeah, All right. Exactly. Pippa, thank you. Welcome back. Well, if you've been with this show for a while, you know how much I love Taylor Swift. Well, on Sunday night, I went to her Eras tour in Nashville. It was night three, and it was a rain show, Joe. True Swifties know we love a rain show because Taylor loves a rain show. We actually thought it might fully get canceled because of a storm advisory because there was so much lightning that they were worried about safety. Eventually, it was lifted and we were able to go. We got the all clear on Twitter. This is after 9 p.m. now. I had to change up my outfit, which I'm pretty sure we have a picture of because of the storm. I literally wore the hotel bathrobe and my husband, or my, not my friend's husband's dress socks because I had been in the rain so much that I had to fully change, but it didn't stop the evening. Taylor did not disappoint. She performed until almost two in the morning, Joe, for us. I mean, the whole thing went from like 10.30 until two in the morning. It was just such a crazy experience. I can't even express. That's all these pedestrians running over this pedestrian footbridge to the stadium as soon as we got the all clear. I mean, it was just an experience. You wore, you wore a bathrobe? I wore a bathrobe <laughs> with a raincoat. Because the thing is, is, this was supposed to start at 6.30, and it was like an 80-degree day. Well, by the middle of the night, the temperature had dropped. I had been in a sundress, so I wore a bathrobe for warmth and then a raincoat over. I mean, Joe, it was seriously pouring the whole time. I think we have a video where you can see actually some of the rain. And she just... She didn't take one thing out of it. Her dancers were even using bikes that are part of the show on the wet stage. It was just, I mean, it was just amazing. She is the best. I think you liked it. I'm going to, I'm going <laughs> to. That's it. That's, That's all. It. All right. You're going to Take it away. Now. All right. Very cool. Thanks <laughs> for that sharing. That does it for this hour of morning news now. But the news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.